Okay, um, good morning everyone. Um, uh, delighted to welcome you to this session, uh, which is going to be focusing on energy. So if you were expecting to hear about something else, then uh, do check your agenda and move to the uh, right session, but hopefully um, you're uh, here to, to, to hear us. Uh, I'm Cara Jenkinson from Ashton, uh, and we're one of the organisers of this conference today. Um, and we're going to be hearing from Alex um, Minchell at Bristol City Council. Uh, we're going to hear him speak for about 15 minutes and then we'll be taking questions um, from the chat or from the Q&A um, uh, uh, tab. You, you'll see both of those to the, to the right of your screen. Um, so quick introduction to Alex. Uh, he is Bristol City's Sustainability and Climate Change um, Lead. And he works uh, with a team of professionals responsible for the council's environmental performance, air quality management, sustainable development, and leading the council's response to the climate emergency. Uh, so without further ado, I'll hand over to Alex. Thanks very much, Cara. Um, and uh, really nice to be uh, with you. Shame we're not all uh, somewhat more in person. So. Um, uh, it'd be nice to be able to see the, the lots of the audience. Um, uh, you'll notice from Cara's introduction that the one thing I'm not responsible for is energy. Um, so you're thinking, what is Alex doing this presentation? So what I'm going to do is talk. I'm going to talk about our energy from a fairly strategic point of view, um, and then we can drill into some of the more specific projects that we're doing during the the Q and A. Um, now, hopefully, this uh, my sharing my screen will work okay. Um, I shall just do that and just run through a, a few slides that I hope will give you a bit of a context. And what I'm really trying to do is sort of think about the, the process that we've gone through rather than the actual detail of specific projects. Um, now let me just see how do I get this. So our climate programme sort of echoes some of the, the layers of act of influence that you might see from the Committee on Climate Change's recent report on the role of local authorities in the sixth carbon budget. And we've sort of got a slightly more simple model, uh, which is that, first of all, we need as an organisation to lead by example. And whilst we're only responsible for about 0.7% of the city's emissions, we think it's crucial that we lead from the front in order to be credible in the work. But also we're a local authority and therefore we have influence within the city and we've just been hearing from previous speakers about the importance of local government action in shaping places. And so it's really important that we play our role as a team member, if you like, in Team Bristol to deliver a, a low carbon city. But we also think we've got a role in uh, enabling action by others and supporting action by others and someone has to help sort of bring people together and convene action by a wide range of partners within a city. And we think that local authority has quite a key role within that. And then finally, and if you like, our, one of our main purpose is that we need support action by the citizens that, that we work for. Um, and we need to enable and support those communities to be part of that low carbon transition. We know that many of our citizens are concerned about climate change and want to take action. And part of what we've got to do is building the systems that enable them to live low carbon lifestyles, but also then uh, support enable them to make the individual change that's needed on top of that systemic change. And finally, we need to create the right conditions uh, for action. We know that no matter how well we do as a local authority, no matter how well we support partners and communities to take action, we can only achieve so much within the national context. We can only go so much faster than the UK as a whole, than national policies and taxation policies, as sort of fiscal policies allow us to. So we need we need to create the right conditions for change. And I'll say a bit more about, about that. In some ways, a bit like we did when we were one of those local authorities that campaigned for the Climate Change Act uh, back in 2008 or so. So that's the sort of context of our, of our program, and hopefully the, 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 what you see will make some sense in that, in that logic. So if we just take our sort of leading by example, and hopefully these, these slides are, are legible, they get a bit more um, pictorial as we go on. Um, but we've been working hard to reduce our emissions for many years, and we've cut the, our direct emissions, our, our overall emissions by about 80%, the ones we've been able to count, and that's a mixture of scope one, two, and three. 
Um, but we've just shifted our, our accounting system now to be uh, focused very much on scope one and two emissions, and we've set a hard target. The mayor has set a target to, uh, to be carbon neutral for scope one and two by 2025. And that is, uh, we're just working through exactly how tough a challenge that actually is. Um, and to help us do that, uh, and also address scope three emissions, we've got four key projects as part of our program, which we started uh, in this spring. The first of those is looking at our existing property estate and ensuring that we, how do we decarbonize that? The second is then looking at our new assets that we're building, whether that's a, a road or a busway or a new building, uh, and to make sure that those are sustainable. And you'll notice that we're talking about sustainable, not just low carbon, because we want those projects to be low carbon, climate resilient, nature rich, and contributing to the wider environmental benefits of the city. There's then also all the other things that goods and services that we buy. And so we have a, a project on working on sustainable procurement. And a number of those projects are embedded within the services that are leading that. So we've embedded a sustainable procurement officer within the procurement team, for example. And then finally, when we need everybody in the city council to be playing their part, and we need to both build up the, the competencies and the confidence of our staff and our colleagues to be able to take action, whether they're a senior leader of the organisation or a councillor making decisions, or whether they're a project manager making choices, asking the questions, deciding what to do on individual schemes. And part of that taking a, a sort of city approach, we were very clear when we developed, when we declared the climate emergency, the mayor was very clear that we needed to bring the whole city together and create a, a climate strategy for the city, not just for the city council. And so that's what we did in, in creating this one city climate strategy, which was very much funded by the city council, but is owned by a much wider range of stakeholders within the city. And it has these twin aims of carbon neutrality, and climate resilience, and all the way through the every se section, uh, of which there are 10, addresses both of those priorities. And you know, we've set out a fairly standard sort of set of, of, of uh, themes that we need to work on, and you'll see these address the territorial emissions of the city, so the energy and, power and transport uh, emissions from within the boundary, but also look at our wider uh, footprint, our global footprint through our food systems, uh, through uh, our, our economy, and very substantial and our consumption and waste. Um, and we've also said that we need to think about what are the enabling conditions for change. So there are reasons why we're not doing doing things in a different way, and we need to create the conditions of those change. And, and so we've identified. In the, through that strategy element, sort of six areas, um, and and those are about data and funding and infrastructure, and they're very much the ones that I'm going to talk about this morning. Um, but it also includes the national action, which I referred to, some of the skills development that's needed in terms of the supply chains and and uh, uh, workers in the city we need, but also the public engagement and that democratic mandate that's so crucial to us doing our work. So we're just looking at the, the evidence and the data. So one of the things we, we did in developing the strategy and we've subsequently uh, enhanced through a, a project with Bayes uh, called the uh, Cities Carbon Decarbonisation Delivery Plan, CDDP. Uh, quite, a, quite a mouthful to remember. Um, and what that project has sought to do is understand in much greater detail the opportunities for decarbonisation. And in this case, we're looking at heat, um, the opportunities for heat decarbonisation within the city at a, at a building by building level and trying to build up an energy plan uh, from the ground upwards rather than doing it theoretically from the top down. And um, that's been with some modelling undertaken by the Centre for Sustainable Energy that's, worked, that's based in Bristol but works nationally. And what that did, for example, with heating, we start to put out some quite precise numbers about the kind of interventions that we needed um, within the city in terms of the number of buildings that need insulation, heat pumps and uh, district heating connections. And it says air source heat pumps. That 
maybe air source, it may be ground source. It was just in terms of using a heat pump for the model. And what that shows is that we believe that we need the energy strategy that's right for our city is a combination of heat pumps, individual heat pumps in the low density areas and uh, district heating in the higher density areas. Uh, you'll notice there's no hydrogen in that in that mix. Um, and for Bristol, we don't see hydrogen playing a significant role in building heating uh, within the next decade, certainly. And we don't see it playing a, a significant role in the long term. Um, and that's partly about the geography of the city and where you might get those kind of hydrogen, that amount of hydrogen from um, and a range of other factors. But we're not saying that's not right for other cities where you may have large arrays, for example, of offshore wind turbines. Um, but what that heat, uh, that sort of electrification strategy effectively does is require a lot more, a lot more heat. Um, and so a lot more power rather um, and you know through the heat pumps that we're that we'll, we'd be needing in fact i just i switched my new heat pump on for the first time uh, this morning uh because we're getting a bit chilly so we had it installed in the summer and so this is the first time we start to really use it in uh, in anger for heating so um we're now part of that little uh purple wedge and we also start to look at what's the opportunities for uh us to generate some of our own power within the city, recognizing that we'll only ever be able to generate a tiny fraction of, of what we uh, what we need, and and so we've done a solar map of that, and we've got started to use that map to do things like target properties for we're currently running a, a group purchasing scheme for citizens to be able to buy uh, solar panels, uh, hopefully at a slightly reduced rate and induce more uptake. That kind of scale of intervention requires a lot of investment. And we've started to enumerate that investment. Um, and this is just really looking at, at heat decarbonisation, um, which gets you to a figure there of what, about two, three billion pounds of investment, um, which is quite substantial. And we've been looking at the rate at which Bristol's energy co colleagues have been able to deliver retrofitting, deliver district heating installations. And they've been doing really well. I'll say a bit more about that in, in, in detail, actually. In fact, yeah, we'll talk a bit about that now. Um, what, for example, we've been doing is, is building uh, city centre district heating networks, using the opportunities of new development to catalyse those, those developments um, and uh, to sort of catalyze those networks and provide those anchor loads and then be able to extend those outwards. And these are networks that are all uh, in planning at the moment. But if you look on the map, what you'll see is that actually we're only talking about networks at the moment within that city, that central area of the city. And the big orangey blob on the left is the proportion of the city we think the district heating might play a significant part in that. And so it doesn't take uh, a rocket scientist to work out that at the rate at which the city council can deliver district heating networks, uh, it, it won't be it won't be enough, and we're going to need to do something else. Um, but one of the things we are doing at the moment is um, I thought I thought might be sort of, of interest within those networks is building a large water source heat pump. So if I just jump back a second, uh, make it more, more clear. So if you look on the center of these of these um, uh, things, you'll see that this is based around Bristol's harbor and we have an impounded harbor within the city center. And so a permanent body of standing water. And one of those networks is basically just on the banks of that, uh, right by our medi the, the platform of our medieval um, uh, castle site and um, so very much at the kind of heart of the city and so what we're installing just to answer uh, Catherine's uh, question there is what we'll be installing for this one is a, a large water source heat pump that will start that is being built at the moment and will then form uh, the, the main energy source for that particular network and we'll be having a transition of networks from some of them is beginning with gas power, moving to renewable energy systems. And we've, we're mapping out the potential uh, energy sources within the city. And I think just like um, colleagues spoke about at the, at the opening session, we're looking at a range of heat sources, including mine waters, um, as well as water and air source. And I talked a little bit about the, the pace at which we might be able to deliver change. And 
one of the 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 challenges is that we needed someone we needed additional capacity and capability within the city to be able to deliver the scale and pace of infrastructure that we that we need and we don't just need a small energy team with a couple of district heating engineers we need dozens if not hundreds of people working on that process and so our aim is to uh, we're currently in procurement and the final stages of procurement to uh, create what we're calling the city leap energy partnership and the leap is not an acronym it's literally literally means a leap a, a big step a giant leap in the amount of process uh, amount of um, uh, progress that we're able to make and we're hoping to announce the successful uh, partner and consortium uh, in about December uh, we're currently down to two consortia and if you can you can get more details about who's involved with those on the uh, the web link that's on this page or if you just google Bristol City Leap Energy Partnership and um, and what we're that program is is hoping to deliver or planning to deliver about a billion pounds of investment within the city over the next 10 years and we think that will be a crucial and sort of central plank of our work to um to decarbonize the city and so what we're also doing is working with uh, a range of other partners on projects within the city uh, working with people like the bristol energy network um, to enable community-owned projects um, in neighbourhoods uh, across the city. We're also working with them, uh, projects on retrofitting and others. Um, and they're all building up the, the range of interventions that we're able to make within the city. Um, but I thought the City Leap Energy Partnership was something that we just wanted to focus on for, for a second. So there we go. That's my slides and hopefully about the right time frame. And I'll then be very pleased to take some questions and, and hear your thoughts and some of the things that you're doing in the city thank you very much alex a uh, really interesting um, presentation good to catch up on the latest of what you're doing so we've already got some questions uh, both in the q a and and the chat so i'll start off with the ones um in the the q a um so um so that's a that's a big question about energy demand reducing energy demand across the city from car at south somerset uh, district council my namesake. Um, so do you want to tackle that one about energy demand? Yeah. Hi, Karen. Nice to uh, see you, if not literally. Um, just, um, yeah, so we're doing a lot of work on, on heat decarbonisation, and there's two strands to that, really. One is is within our own estate. So the City Council is a social housing provider. We have about 28,000, 27,000 homes. Um, and we've done a lot of work on getting those up to to uh, band C, actually. And in some ways, we're ahead of the, the curve. And I think some colleagues are finding, actually, some of the current social housing decolonization funding doesn't isn't quite so useful for us because we've already addressed some of those many of the worst properties within our own estate um and so we're looking at the next next wave of that so we're working on our own estate and so there's a parallel piece of work uh, going on to our property estate i should have mentioned actually um but also we're trying to work with other social housing providers and so yesterday we had a, a we created a forum for social housing decarbonisation to share learning and knowledge across that sector within the city uh, and potentially wider um, and then finally um, we, we're doing a lot of, quite a work, work on new builds and our planning policies so we've got some quite strong planning policies although they are now quite old and we're using those increasingly for example to get better insulation and uh, avoid the insulation of gas boilers in major developments um, but we um, we're also working on the new local plan policies, and those will be very much about zero carbon um, uh, policies for all new development. And in fact, council passed a recent motion uh, that had received cross-party support for zero carbon policies in our new local plan. Thank you very much. And actually, there's a session running from uh, York City Council also looking at kind of very low carbon uh, uh, development, um, which you can catch up on afterwards uh, as well. Um, so more kind of strategic question here from uh, from Christopher Deer. Was your carbon neutral target a conscious decision 
over a net zero target. And there's lots of debate about the term net zero. Um, so, yeah, your thoughts on that? Yeah. Um, so it was it was the it was the language that was adopted by council. Um, and I think if we were doing it now, we would adopt net zero rather than carbon neutrality. Um, and and also it was a uh, target, the, 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 the date mode, but the, the language was, I suppose, created by the mayor when in his manifesto when he committed to carbon neutrality. Uh, so I think it's, it's just a language that we happen to use. Uh, it doesn't bother me whether it's carbon neutral or net zero. What we're meaning is is the same thing. We're actually meaning no green, no net greenhouse gas emissions, and to be net zero, you effectively need to be zero, because the ability to to offset is so limited, even if you even if you wanted to do it. So, to all intents and purposes, we're all talking about the same thing, and also to some extent, I. I'm less bothered about when we cross that origin on the graph. When we actually hit zero, doesn't bother me. It's the shape of the graph that really bothers me. So actually, if we don't hit 2030, and I think that's going to be a very hard target to achieve, um, it's about how, how close to zero we've got by then. So it's about how quickly can we bring down our emissions in the next five to 10 years, not exactly when do we cross a line and exactly what the definition of that line is. Thank you. Um, do use the uh, the voting buttons to kind of upvote the questions if that's uh, a question that you're particularly interested in. So I think probably a lot of um, people on this call will look at in, in envy at what you're doing at Bristol, um, Alex. And one question is about uh, is about capacity and how did the council go about um, uh, building the capacity in your energy team uh, and your sustainability team more broadly? And what were the major barriers? How did you overcome them? Yeah, so our energy team was very much built up thanks to uh, a grant from the European Commission um, through their ELNA program, the European Local Energy Assistance Program. Um, and what that grant was able to do was provide us with the, the, the core funding to uh, develop our energy program uh, and and develop that pipeline of projects and then once the pipeline was starting to flow then it became possible to demonstrate the value of having an energy service energy team and therefore uh, to invest in that capacity and you sort of got a you then got a capital once you've got your capital program rolling you can generate you can justify the team that you need to deliver that program does if that makes sense but yeah that two million pound grant from the european commission was absolutely crucial at getting us uh, to that line um unfortunately uh, there isn't anything quite like that available uh, at the moment so um i'm sorry that's 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 the that's the answer but i'm not sure how helpful it, it is and um, in terms of building up the capacity of the of the sustainability team um more broadly i think what we've been we've been fortunate in having administrations that recognize that if you're going to set a target and you're going to set some ambitious goals you need the capacity to deliver those you need the people to deliver those it doesn't happen uh, with existing resources and they recognize that they have to invest throughout the supply chain of the organization you can't just have the capacity at one end of it you need you need to build it up throughout the, the organization um, and so we've been fortunate with our sustainability program to uh, secure about four million pounds over the next over three years three to four years um, of resources some of which is revenue funding and some of which is a, a one-off um, and that's what's enabling us to deliver our existing program and, and have specific projects as I mentioned within just focusing on the energy bit just within our own our own estate our own procurement etc um, so it's the combination of revenue funding and, and one-off um, commitments thank you very much um yeah if, if only um, we still had access to European funding. Um, so, uh, yeah, question from uh, from Simon, my colleague at Ashton. Um, so could you say a little more about how you're delivering the twin requirements of home insulation and heat pumps? Uh, your slide suggested at combined costs. Uh, not sure whether that was the right amount. It was lots of money. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, I don't think we've, we haven't quite cracked that yet so um within the so we've so what we were identifying there was the requirement uh 
um, and not necessarily the solution. So within the social housing uh, stock, I think it's going to be a combination of our own investment and the the um, housing revenue accounts and landlord services are keen to invest in energy efficiency for their estate. Um, it's one of their tenants' priorities, but they don't have they, their business plan can't sustain the level of investment that's needed to do this. So it, that's going to require central government funding through the social housing decarbonisation fund or others. Um, when we look more broadly, we think there are opportunities, particularly for City Leap. Uh, to make investment, and that's a private sector investment into energy efficiency and decarbonisation within within buildings and retrofit. So that's how we see it moving forward and bringing, and that's how we might bring more scale to the uh, the supply chain as well. Mm. And just uh, thinking about the term, uh, just a follow on, thinking about the term investment, that suggests a return. How will that return be uh, realised through a programme like that? That's a whole other uh <laughs> session i think um and uh yeah so there's a yeah that's a whole other session and i'm probably i'm not the right person to talk to that level of detail cara okay no worries no worries okay so let's see we've got lots of votes for a question from marie louise um okay so the new build developments you mentioned close to, uh, close to the city center how have you negotiated with developers to buy into the district heating etc who puts up the initial investment for the infrastructure? Okay, um, so we've got partly we're using our existing planning policy uh, hooks to do that, um, and we within certainly those sort of dis, the <clears throat> the small networks we're seeing at the moment, uh, we've been able to uh, prioritise those areas for for that work. Um, I, I guess some developers are coming to us and going, this is great. You, you, you've got an offer that allows us to build a building without so much cap capital expenditure. Uh, we don't need to make so much room in our plant rooms. Therefore, that gives us more um, lettable, usable space. That's great. Uh, please, can you provide that service? Um, I think many others, um, and probably the majority, uh, need some persuading that they need to operate in a different way. And it is partly a, neg uh, a negotiation process and partly uh, planning applications being refused uh, because they weren't providing uh, energy compliant, weren't compliant with our energy policies. And uh, planning officers and planning committees have been able to make those re refusals um, on a number of a number of cases, usually that's that's obviously not the place you want to get. To. You want to go, go through that negotiation process, but it's not a it's not a straightforward process at all. Thank you. And then a question about uh, energy. Oh, sorry, let me just sorry, Carol. And I think that's where things like national policy and regulation will be crucial because that will then make the industry say, well, actually, maybe in certain geographical areas, it's it's district heating by default unless there's a really good reason to do it. So that's where we, the sort of conversation that colleagues are having with, with Bayes and with other regulators so that we can have the right regulatory system that will make district heating a viable alternative. And you're not having to uh, fight every single or, or negotiate through every single individual development. It becomes the default and that will, that's what changed. So that's why it's really important that we think about what local government can do, but also how we need to create the right Getting back to my slides about the enabling conditions that we need. Otherwise, it, we are kind of always trying to push that ball uphill. Yeah. Do you think the future home standards uh, coming in 2025, is that going to help specifically on district heating? Not really, no. The future home standards is, is, is not adequate. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, um, thank you. Good question from Lisa. Uh, do you have any plans to facilitate energy efficiency improvements in private rented housing? So that's always the difficult sector uh, to treat. Uh, this is a huge issue for us, uh, reaching any net zero targets in Southampton. Uh, yes, but I must admit, I don't have the details. Um, and uh, so colleagues uh, are, are looking at that, but... Um, Yes, yeah, so I can't. I can't give you the, the the details. Sorry, but but do if you. I should have put my email on the slides, but it's alex.minshall at bristol.gov.uk, and uh, if you want to drop me a line, I can always connect you with the with the colleagues in the energy service working on private sector stuff. Okay. 
Okay, uh, now there was one that I was looking um, for. Yeah, um, so um, yeah, what the, another one from, um, from Cara um, about communication. Um, so how do you communicate to the community on what you're doing, keeping them up to date on what you're doing to get to carbon neutrality? Um, I think the honest answer is probably not well enough. Um, I think we can always do do more to, to do that communication. Um, so uh, one of the, so there's, let me just think about the best way to answer that. So as part of our, our comms, we've got a number of different uh, layers to it. So the first one is about providing people with information. And so we've got a, a climate hub website, which is about what they can do. And it's very much about the sort of individual behaviours, uh, and it's based on on uh, sort of fairly sort of sounds of behavioural thinking. And what it does is allow you to tailor your it tailors the advice it gives you based on your individual circumstances. So, for example, if you don't have a car, it doesn't suggest that you drive it less or that you buy an EV. Um, the other so that's sort of basic providing information and we're we're now wanting to kind of turn that much more into sort of inspiring stories of people doing things themselves and, and people like so that individuals can see people like themselves in our many and varied forms and shapes doing things uh, that are part of the decarbonisation even if it's not obviously so and so we've got a set of videos that are being produced at the moment, which will be launched shortly, showing people from the communities doing uh, low carbon activities to inspire and encourage. Um, we're also then working with a number of communities on some more in-depth action planning, thanks to funding from the National Lottery and their, and their community action fund. And those communities are developing their own action plans of um, about what they feel is, is going to be the decarbonisation journey for those those areas or those communities of interest. So it's four communities of place and two communities of interest, um, including the, for example, the disability forum of the city. Um, and those plans uh, are just say so just coming forward now and will and hang got very much off our our one city climate strategy in terms of the priorities, but will hopefully reflect the, the needs and aspirations of those individual communities and we can respond to those. Um, in terms of the other thing we've just, just done is create a, uh, a new brand for climate action and also nature recovery action that draws on our sort of city branding, the sort of Bristol logo, and the city council will be using that on everything that we're doing that is contributing to climate and nature recovery um and we'll be wanting lots of um, and lots of other partners will be using it as well and so the idea is it's not just about you'll see that on a cycle lane you'll see that on an energy system you'll see it on our food work um but also you'll see it on stuff coming out of the, the nhs stuff coming out of the universities so that hopefully people start to see it's not just the odd thing that's very obviously climatey that's contributing, but actually a wide range of activities within the city. And hopefully that'll get us near to somewhere like enough, yeah. but probably not. Sounds like sounds like a good plan. I like the idea of the branding. Um, just a, a question from me, Chair's Prerogative. Um, so Ashton, very interested in uh, skills, building up green skills. Um, so you know, you've talked about 10,000 jobs, um, the potential for. Um, how are you working with uh, local colleges? Uh, uh, I'm sure you're working with the university sector, but specifically thinking about the kind of skills you're going to need to do the heat pumps, the district heating, and, and all the rest of it. Yeah, um, so uh, there's a number of parts to that. So one is um, we're working with a, there's a project within the city called Future Proof that's working with SMEs, uh, particularly and particular micro businesses, doing retrofit work to help upskill them and provide them with training and organisations. And that's it, the two organisations running that are the Centre for Sustainable Energy and um, the Green Register. Um, and that's but that's a fairly small, modest project at, at this point in time. But we hope we can that can be developed. Um, the colleges we've we've had if you've been in this game for a while, there's been the challenge of, we know the skills are needed, but the, it hasn't necessarily been the customer demand of the builders. 
and therefore the builders don't want to spend the time doing the work doing the training when they're busy doing if you're kind of busy building kitchen extensions or whatever why do you want to take time out or busy fitting gas boilers? why do you take out time out to train for a thing that there isn't yet a clear customer demand for and so we're trying to break that that catch 22 where the colleges won't provide it because the builders don't want it because the customers don't want it and so there is some project going on with the um the colleges and our skills people and the combined authority to look at um what skills are needed and to actually start to provide those that training ahead of need and i think uh, we've probably i think this time around we might actually crack it Sounds good. And I'm just wondering, in terms of you talked about the procurement process for City Leap and delivering uh, uh, ESG, environmental, social value, etc. Are you building into that procurement project uh, sort of a, a requirement to work with local colleges to skill up local people? Um, whether it's as specific as that, but certainly, yeah, the, 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 the purpose of the City Leap partnership and why it's not just a a standard kind of procurement of a of a service provider is very much about we want a partner that, that shares our values and wants to deliver a, a range of benefits for the city, not just decarbonisation. Um, uh, and so, yes, that absolutely that's that principle is absolutely part of that procurement. Yeah. Thank you. Right. Let's see. Uh, go back to the uh, to the chat. OK. Um, uh, another question about the, the heat and building strategy, which is uh, which is coming up. And I don't know whether you've got any views on that and what you'd like to see in it uh, to support your work in Bristol. Oh, uh, um, list. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's quite. Uh, so I suppose w what we've uh, seen uh some of the, the challenges that, that, that we're grappling with, um, which that strategy could potentially help with. The first is the right conditions for district heating um, and creating those the, the right regulatory arrangements that will mean that district heating becomes default in, in key places, but also there's the appropriate customer safeguards, et cetera, that can bring confidence to the market um, and confidence to the consumer and also confidence to to developers and housing providers that they're not going to be landing their future residents with a monopolistic unfair provider and um, so i think that's one one key area um, the other is around the level of funding that's needed to uh, and government funding that's needed to unlock the private sector wealth that exists within the, you know, there are a lot of people within Bristol, within many towns and cities around this country who can afford to retrofit their homes. Um, and we just need to in, induce them to do so. And, and we saw the Green Home Grant, for example, the demand for that was so great um, and there wasn't the supply chain. So something that can induce that demand um, in a more sustainable um, fashion would be really helpful. Exactly what that mechanism looks like, I, I, I'm not clever enough to design. Um, uh, and then there's something also for us, touched on the question that someone posted yourself, Cara, about how do you um, bring recycle benefits and how do you bring benefits back to the people who make, want to need to make that investment, that split incentive problem that we've got in the rented sector, particularly, uh, which applies particularly in the, it applies in the residential sector, but also applies in an awful lot of the commercial estate as well. How do you build the uh, restore the the incentive loop for the investors? Thank you. Um, and just um, you talk, touched a bit on this. Uh, Lucy has a question about sort of partnership and 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 how much buy in are you getting from other organisations and individuals? Um, and what roles are they taking in the delivery of the programme to the city and not just the council? Uh, how is this achieved? And I'm thinking about Bristol City, um, Bristol, I always get the names of it that wrong, Bristol Capital Partnership, is it? Green Capital um, Partnership, uh, yeah. Organisation in the city, everyone together on this. Yeah, so, um, yeah, so I think our climate strategy came out in uh, beginning of March 2020. Um, so the timing in some ways couldn't have been worse for uh, building momentum off the back of the development of that strategy. Um, and many of the partners that we would 
including the council that we wanted to work with, you know, were either in resp COVID response mode or survival mode for their own organisations in some cases. Um, and so, uh, but just that that interest is now is now rebuilding, and there's a lot of people wanting to to decarbonise. So, I, I guess there's a couple of layers to it. First is we're seeing a lot of interest now from organizations who want to who are committing to decarbonize their own emissions um and since the city is you know the sum total of many different organizations and individuals if we can get north decarbonize then guess what the city becomes that so there's a lot of interest from that and we're helping to support that through the network that courage mentioned which is the bristol green capital partnership uh, and also our business network business west so the Green Capital Partnership is a network, it's a CIC with, a, with about a thousand member organisations now, over a thousand member organisations, uh, looking to uh, create a sustainable city. Um, and they've created with Business West a programme called Climate Leaders Group, which is a kind of peer support programme for uh, organisations that have committed to being net zero by 2030. Um, and they're working uh together on that and they're also running a series of other workshops to support businesses and organizations that aren't quite that ready to make that commitment yet and um, we're also developed as part of this strategy we're also looking for partners who are looking to play a, a bigger role within the city and to step up and help us deliver strands of the one city climate strategy and um, those conversations have kind of really really big up re really re begun in earnest now um, and we're hoping that some of those organizations will be able to announce them fairly soon um, but we can't just say them right now okay um question um a bit more, more technical i don't know if you're able to answer that um so do you have a policy this question from kenneth do you have a, a policy for the installation of P, uh, solar pv panels on housing as a means of powering heat pumps is there a requirement to have a certain level of optimize, uh, uh, insulation to optimise the benefits of heat pumps? Um, so, our um, so no, we don't have a specific policy. Our planning policy um, is a, a hierarchy policy, and it dates back from two thousand and seven. So, um, it's a technology agnostic policy and sets out a, a, a thinking process, a hierarchy that you need to work through to demonstrate that you're going for the best options. Um, so what we're seeing with new developments coming forward is they tend to do fabric first, because um, that's often the cheapest, and then looking at a range of other uh, heat pumps and PV solutions. I mean, obviously heat pumps and PVs, that, from my point, the main, the main focus is to offset the potential extra cost of running the heat pump, uh, rather than actually powering the heat pump because of the seasonal uh, mismatch. Um, but certainly when we're looking at some of our own um, uh, housing stock, we are looking at doing both those interventions if we if we can. But there isn't a specific policy as such. Thank you. And um, yeah, a question about, you mentioned that hydrogen isn't part of your, uh, your heating strategy. Um, are you looking at biomethane gas at all as an option in the, in the gas grid? Is that a factor? <laughs> Um, no, I, I think for similar reasons is is there isn't enough of it um, in in this sort of part of the world. Um, we got we fortunate in having the the sewage works was already generating quite a lot of biomethane, um, and they've been adding food waste to that, and so that's generating uh, a, a green gas that's being used, for example, by uh, increasingly by the bus fleet um, in uh, in gas powered buses. It's obviously hypothecated, but um, it, it gets, the, gets the point. But I, I can't imagine where you would get enough biomethane to run a city on. Yeah. OK, we're um, very nearly at the end. I just want to ask one final question, which is about bringing your council colleagues on board. You know, you need to get planning on board and legal on board and all of this to get a project like this working. How did you go about skilling up those other departments? Um, so I think it's very much so all the support from colleagues uh, around the organization um, and you talk about skilling up. Um, so we, we, it's very much a live process at the moment. We are doing a combination of, um, if you like, we've got layers of training. So some of it is awareness and, and basic understanding of climate change. Um, and we've developed some e-modules that anyone can, can use. We're doing training with 
senior managers about how do they climate change is now a key part of our corporate strategy how do they start to translate that corporate strategy into practical actions in their service plans and all the kind of really boring <laughs> bureaucratic stuff that enables action to happen in a big organization whether it's in the public or private sector so which are in, in amongst the the plumbing of the organization to try and uh, achieve that um, and my, my general sense is that actually colleagues understand the political priority that this has with, for the administration and want to make it happen and so it's about how do we help them develop the professional skills encourage them to come to events like this uh, encourage their own professional development this becomes this is an area of learning that everybody um, needs to know about uh, at different levels and we've got a colleague who's specific I suppose one of the short answers we've got a colleague who's specifically working uh, part-time on our climate change training program okay. so we've got a resource to actually push it forward rather than try and do it as part of one of many things great well um, I'd like to say thank you very much Alex for um, answering all of those questions that was a, a good long list and I think we had a really nice wide-ranging uh, discussion uh, thank you to all of those for uh, listening. These sessions are being recorded and they will be available on the uh, Net Zero local website uh, probably in two or three days, something like that. Um, so we're done on this workshop now. So you can leave by just pressing the leave button on the top right. And then we have a break. So do take the chance to uh, look at the expo booth, uh, do a bit of the networking um, uh, as, uh, as uh, Alan described at the beginning. And I'm sure that uh, if you want to speak to Alex directly, hopefully he'll be around, I think, for some, some networking if you do want to ask him specific questions. Uh, and uh, see some of you again at the, at the next session, uh, which will be starting at 10.40. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks for coming. Take care.